Hi, uh, my name is John O'Keefe, and I'm the director of the Center for Catholic Thought here at Creighton uh, University, and this is we're the sponsor of this evening's lecture. But I'd like to welcome you all to the 17th annual Lawler Lecture in Catholic Theology. The lecture series is named to honor Michael G. Lawler, PhD, who is Professor Emeritus of Catholic Theology here at Creighton. The Lawler Lecture is an endowed lecture series made possible by a generous gift from one of Lawler's former students. This evening, I have the honor to introduce John Peter Kenny, who is Professor of Religious Studies at St. Michael's College in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, John and I have been friends for many years. I, I think we figured out today since 1995. And he was also a, a close friend of uh, Bill Harmless. Uh, in fact, late last spring, Father Harmless and I were having lunch and hit upon the idea of inviting John to finally come to Creighton and share with us some of the wonderful work he has been doing on Augustine. And I'm sure if Bill were here with us tonight, he would doubtless be seated in the front row, ready to pounce at the end with his characteristic enthusiasm. Professor Kenny received his PhD from Brown University in 1982 and began his career at Reed College, where he earned the rank of professor, while also, I might add, serving as department chair for many years. In 1995, he had the opportunity to return to his native New England as dean of St. Michael's College, a position he held for 10 years before, before returning to full-time service on the faculty. Kenny has had many interests over the years, his first book examined the development of pagan monotheism among Platonists, especially Plotinus. He has written studies on Gnosticism and early Christian philosophy and edited a volume on Philo of Alexandria. More recently, however, he has turned his scholarly talents to Augustine, whose ideas Kenny describes as challenging, arresting, and profound. This Augustinian turn has so far produced two important books, in 2005, he published The Mysticism of St. Augustine, rereading the Confessions. And I note, this was the same year he retired from being dean. So I guess you were writing while you were dean, which is even more impressive. And finally, his most recent book, Contemplation in Classical Christianity, The Study of Augustine, was published by Oxford University Press in 2013. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kinney as he speaks to us on the topic, The Mysticism of St. Augustine. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor O'Keefe. Uh, I'm just delighted uh, to be here. It's, uh, I've always wanted to get to Creighton. I have a couple of cousins who are Creighton grads. I now understand that means they're Blue Jays. I hadn't really acquired that term for them. Uh, and they're such keen alums that uh, I've wanted to be here. So I'm, I'm just thrilled. And so thanks for coming. And uh, I hope you all have my handout. I've got the handout out there for, for most of you. By now, uh, there are a few in the back. Do we have any left? Uh, do we know? I think we're, we've exhausted the supply, I'm sorry to say. All right, so I want to start this, uh, this afternoon with a very famous passage from the Confessions. It's one of the most famous uh, passages. And I want to use it to uh, start us off to understand the, uh, uh, the topic that I'll be addressing today. And if you look at it, it's actually a pretty startling concept that he puts forward, particularly at the end. Uh, I'll be using the standard Oxford translations by uh, Henry Chadwick today. Augustine writes, summarizing sort of his story, late have I loved thee, beauty so old and so new, late have I loved you. And see, you were within, and I was in the external world, and I sought you there. And in my unlovely state, I plunged into those lovely created things which you made. You were with me, and I was not with you. The lovely things kept me far from you, though if they did not have their existence in you, they had no existence at all. You called and cried aloud and shattered my deafness. You were radiant and resplendent. You put to flight my blindness. You were fragrant, and I drew in my breath and now pant after you. I tasted you, and I feel but hunger and thirst for you. You touched me, and I am set on fire to attain the peace which is yours. Now notice, Augustine is claiming 
that he had unmediated association with God in this text. That he somehow touched the divine and that God somehow came into contact with him. So our question this afternoon is the following. How are we to understand what Augustine is depicting? To answer that, we need to take a close look at several passages that are usually read as instances of mysticism, as unique personal spiritual experiences that are thought to occur in the same way across the world's religion. That, as, our, as it were, is our cultural default position. Augustinian scholars have, in fact, spent the last century debating how many mystical experiences are described in the text of the Confessions. Now, while I don't think that this interpretive line is simply wrong, I do think it is inadequate. Based as it is on a modern concept, that of mysticism or mystical experience, that is itself a product of the 19th and 20th centuries. There are several problems with this default position. It exemplifies the modern tendency to treat the spiritual states of the individual self as separable from their social and cultural contexts. Moreover, it assumes that the raw experience itself is what's really valuable rather than its interpretation within cultural or theological traditions. And mysticism is thereby regarded as a matter of personal spirituality, deeper and somehow more authentic than religion or theology. Now, I regard this approach in many ways as too freighted with modern assumptions to be very useful in reading the Confessions. Indeed, there is a cold friction between this contemporary model and the ancient texts. So I propose this afternoon to push back again against this exegesis of the Confessions in the hope that we can uncover what Augustine was really saying in these passages. For when thus represented, the story, I think, becomes much more interesting. For it is my contention that Augustine was helping to articulate what became the Latin Christian ideal of contemplation, of interior practice of the presence of God within the soul. That is, he is establishing with persuasive autobiographical vividness the notion of a moment of Christian enlightenment, one that secures immediate knowledge of God, but not salvation. Let me reiterate that, immediate knowledge of God, but not salvation. It is on the basis of this ancient Christian conception that the modern psychological notion of mystical experience, now a matter of spiritual feelings, was later constructed. When this modern psychological notion is read back into the confessions, we lose sight of the theological import and the novelty of the Augustinian text. We miss the richness of Augustine's own efforts at Christian self-articulation. So what I am doing this afternoon is presenting a reading that attempts to give the Christian dimension of these passages full weight. Now, before I proceed, I want to note the scholarship is seldom done alone. And that is uh, certainly true of the thesis that I am putting forward. The argument I'm making today was something that I discussed in detail with Father Bill Harmless of Blessed Memory. Bill read my work for years and gave me a great deal of very helpful feedback. He used to come to my conference talks and Root, as was mentioned earlier, enthusiastically. You know, he was so into it. I used to feel like I was making three-pointers, uh, which in my case would be mystical, I can assure you. Right? So I'm sure we all, we all miss him, and may God bless him. So I want to turn now on my handout to the first section, uh, Platonism, Plotinus, and Pagan Monotheism. So I want to begin by looking at a text from Confession 7. To understand it, we have to take a brief pagan detour. 
First, let's clarify the historical context. Augustine was born in North Africa in what is now Algeria around 354. His father, Patricius Patrick, was a pagan. His mother, Monica, was a Catholic. But when he went off to college to study the liberal arts, Augustine rejected both religions and became a Manichae, a heterodox form of Christianity. Augustine rejected Catholicism because it seemed to him unsophisticated to believe in an anthropomorphic God, especially the God of the Old Testament, a God who could walk in the Garden of Eden, get angry, hurl fire and brimstone, etc. Manichaeism rejected the Old Testament and taught instead that the world was the product of a continuing war between two primal energies, light good on the one hand and darkness and evil on the other. Most importantly, it was a type of materialism, since both light and darkness were understood literally as forces within the cosmos. So these are two contending energies in a conflict dualism. Now, we are all, helpfully, uh, familiar with this way of thinking from its modern manifestation, the Star Wars epics, in which, and I do not exaggerate here, George Lucas used a version of this dualistic model devised by the famous comparative religion professor, Joseph Campbell. Okay? So it's these two contending energies going on within the cosmos that attracted Augustine because it appeared to be a scientific way of thinking. Over time, however, Augustine became disillusioned with Manichaeism. And at the same time, his career as a rhetorician was taking off, indeed leading him to the zenith of the Roman world, to the imperial court in Milan. Augustine tells us that uh, it was then that he encountered Ambrose, the bishop of Milan, and some Catholic intellectuals who suggested that he read pagan philosophy to move his religious quests forward towards the sophisticated Catholicism that they espoused. The year is somewhere around 385 or 6. And so we read the pagan Platonists, probably including works by Plotinus, the revered Greco-Egyptian Platonist who taught in Rome around 250 to 270. The pagans, he was both a great philosopher, and a holy man. When Augustine started writing his autobiography around 397, just after he became a Catholic bishop, he explained the impact of Platonism. He says that Platonism gave him two insights, and these are on the handout. First, Platonism catalyzed for him the recognition of a transcendent world, of another level of reality, outside of space and time, beyond the cosmos. And moreover, he came to recognize an infinite God who transcended the finite world. So that's critical move number one. Second, he also learned that every soul is divine and capable of saying, uh, saving itself through an inner access to higher levels of reality. I'll be explaining this further in a moment. As we'll see, Augustine will come to accept the first idea, transcendence, and reject the second, that is, the idea of the divinity of the soul and its capacity for self-salvation. Now, the following passage from Book 7 recounts Augustine's recognition of transcendence. It's a kind of moment of enlightenment for him. Remember, at this stage, Augustine is not yet a baptized Christian. Right, so he's in a kind of spiritual limbo. He's, he's giving up on Manichaeism. He's skeptical. Right, and he tells us the following. So this is number two on the handout from 7, 10, 16. And by the way, I'm, I'm going to be reading some of these texts because I think it's really important not to hear someone talk about Augustine, but for you to actually have the texts you know, and see the texture of his thought, as it were. By the Platonic books, I was admonished to return into myself. With you as my guide, I entered into my innermost citadel and was given the power to do so because you would become my helper. I entered and, with my soul's eye such as it was, saw above that same eye of the soul the immutable light higher than my mind, not the light of every day obvious to anyone, 
nor a larger version of the same kind, which would, as it were, have given out a much brighter light and filled everything with its magnitude. It was not that light, but a different thing, utterly different from all our kinds of light. It transcended my mind, not in the way that oil floats on water, nor as heaven is above the earth. It was superior because it made me, and I was inferior because I was made by it. The person who knows the truth knows it, and he who knows it knows eternity. Love knows it. Eternal truth and true love and beloved eternity, you are my God. To you I sigh day and night. When I first came to know you, you raised me up to make me see that what I saw is being, and that I who saw am not yet being. And you gave a shock to the weakness of my sight by the strong radiance of your rays, and I trembled with love and awe, and I found myself far from you in a region of dissimilarity, and heard, as it were, your voice from on high, I am the food of the fully grown, grow and you will feed on me. And you will not change into me like the food your flesh eats, but you will be changed into me. And I recognize that because of iniquity, you disciplined man and caused my soul to waste away like a spider's web. And I said, surely truth cannot be nothing when it is not diffused through space, either finite or infinite. And you cried from aloud, I am who am. I heard in the way one hears within the heart and all doubt left me. I would have found it easier to doubt whether I was myself alive than that there is no truth understood through the things that are made. This is a very, very powerful passage. So the question is, how are we to come to terms to it? Now, whatever this text is about, it's not simply the record of a mystical experience understood in the modern sense. It is a complex theological self-description saturated with ideas drawn from a whole range of Platonist and scriptural sources. Now, as I've just indicated, there are two key notions that Augustine derived from his reading of Platonism that drive the contemplative passages of the Confessions, and I want to unpack these for a moment to help us understand this passage and some others. So, back to number one, divine transcendence, which you can see all through that passage I've just been reading. He derives this from pagan monotheism from the Platonists. And I think it's very important for us to realize that to believe in one God is to believe in many things. Monotheism is a very complex claim. The very singularity of God has to be explained in terms of God's ultimate nature. And that required very profound and powerful reflection in antiquity. It is only quite recently that we've come to recognize the fundamental significance of pagan theology in this conceptual framing of monotheism. This pagan monotheism was quite distinct, of course, from the biblical sort, countenancing, as it did, a pantheon of gods and encouraging cult uh, cultic association with these lower divinities. And yet, pagan theology came increasingly to recognize an ultimate, single power behind and beyond the pantheon. The later Platonists were in the vanguard of this shift to pagan monotheism. This is because they developed a critical concept, that concept of divine transcendence. And they used this to explain the ultimacy of the one, as they called their God, the one or the good. Now, thinking about God as transcendent or immaterial comes easily to us, but it came very hard to the ancients. Let's think about this for a moment. When uh, players score touchdowns, they sometimes Point up to the sky in gratitude. We see this a lot, of course, where I'm from in New England, uh, where touchdowns are common. Uh, but even uh, Patriots fans, like me, don't really think that God is out there in the heavens looking down on Foxborough. Nor, for example, are Christians agitating for NASA to send probes into deep space looking for God. Right? That's not where, in a sense, we think God is. Weirdly, by the way, in 1959, Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet leader, claimed that the existence of God had been refuted because Yuri Gagarin, the first cosmonaut in space, hadn't seen God up there. 
right? Famous event, right? Where he says, Gagarin, Boja Nivil. I didn't see God, so end of that. But Khrushchev's remark was, was greeted with puzzlement in the West, since most people had already come to regard God as immaterial. But the ancients, pagans, Jews, and Christians, did think that God was somehow out there, right, in the heavens, within the cosmos, in some respect, an attenuated form of a material energy. And it's only the Platonists and then some Christian Platonists who begin to make that thinking change. So for Augustine, the very notion of an immaterial God was novel and arresting and life-changing. In fact, he tells us that he only got that idea from reading the books of the pagan philosophers, the Platonists. So Augustine's failure to grasp the notion of transcendent reality was more than just a function of his Manichaean theology. It was also a product of his North African Christian past, where the theology he had encountered when he was young lacked the sophisticated transcendentalism of Ambrose and his circle of Christian or Catholic intellectuals in Milan. I think this fact really bears pondering. Augustine's story makes no sense unless this materialist interpretation of Christianity was so widespread that a well-educated North African rhetorician could, on his own testimony, reach his early 30s before encountering the very idea of transcendence. Let me make this point now by quoting a Jesuit, Father Roland Teske from Marquette. Prior to Augustine, at least in Western Christianity, there was no philosophical concept of incorporeal being of being that is whole wherever it is. A striking thought. Another quote from Professor Carol Harrison now of Oxford. Until now, she's talking about Augustine, Augustine had been restricted by materialistic philosophy, characteristic of most thinkers of his day, which lacked any concept of spiritual or transcendent reality. Now, I think this is a major clue to the meaning of the so-called mystical passages of the Confessions. Point number two, salvation in the divine soul. Platonist theology focused on the one and its immediate presence to the human soul. Since the one was the source of all reality, its association with the soul was intimate. Spiritual contemplation in Plotinus was, therefore, an act of enlightenment. It does not so much transform the soul as reveal, as it were, how deep the soul goes. For in inner contemplation, the self discovers that it is grounded in the one, that it has never been cut off from it, despite the exigencies of mortal life. As a result, Plotinus was confident that the philosopher is capable of detaching the higher soul from lower levels of reality, even while still embodied. Death seems somehow to be beside the point for the soul who has recovered its eternal self and its life in union with the one. There's a wonderful quote that captures this from De Abstinencia by, by Porphyry, the student and biographer of Plotinus. He says, in every respect, the philosopher is the savior of himself. Very powerful quote. This outlook defines the soteriology of the Plotinian school. It rests in particular on the Plotinian theory of an undescended or higher soul. According to Plotinus, none of us is really fully fallen into the world, and each of us has the capacity to realize our salvation right here and now, through contemplation of the one by the divine aspect of our inner self. That is the message of Plotinus's pagan theology, that we are divine. Augustine came to forcefully reject this second notion. Back now to the confessions and to the next section, the limits of contemplation. In a garden in Milan beneath a fig tree in spring, 
Augustine be, uh, hears the fugitive voice of a child from a nearby house singing tole lege, tole lege, like a jump rope song, take up and read, take up and read. He tells us in Book 8 that this event sets off his moral conversion, leading to his baptism and culminating in the famous vision at Ostia in Book 9 that we'll look at shortly. The contemplative texts that we find in Book 7 that precede these dramatic events have usually been regarded as descriptions of failure, as vain attempts at mystical experience. The idea among scholars seems to be that Augustine failed to have a mystical experience until after he was baptized. That seems to be the, the way this reading works. But I'd like to offer a quite different reading. I think Augustine offers, throughout the Confessions, a consistent account of successful contemplation according to his Christian criteria. The contemplative episodes of Book 7 and the vision at Ostia of Book 9 present basically the same perspective. The contemplation offers immediate knowledge of God, but not salvation. Augustine's soul achieves direct knowledge of God in all of these texts, but in each instance he becomes aware of its limitations. On this reading, Augustine is using his autobiography to serve a specific apologetic end, disabusing pagan Platonists of their soteriological claims while certifying that the cognitive benefits of contemplation are accessible to Catholic Christians, even those like Monica, who are not educated and not philosophers. If we circle back to the passage that we just read, we can see this quite clearly. This passage asserts that Augustine's soul succeeds in the experience of truth. With divine guidance and assistance, he enters into his own inner self, there to discover the interior light of the Logos present to the soul. The oculus animae, the eye of the soul, discovers that the soul has transcendent depth. While Platonism forms the text's background, the intimacy of its second-person address and its conception of direct divine guidance constitute Christian departures. Indeed, this divine assistance comes at the very beginning of the process of contemplation. This text does not simply record an attempt at a mystical experience, and neither is there any failure here since it demonstrates conclusively the error of Manichaeism. The text records contemplation of a personal God distinct from the soul and existing at a higher level of reality. And the text also records a different mode of contemplation related to but distinct from that of the Plotinian school. As such, the text exhibits a successful moment of Christian contemplation. Now, the other great Ascension text of Book 7 is found at 717.23, and that's number 3 on our handout. So I want now to have a look at it. It's uh, important to remember, once again, that Augustine is not yet, at this point in the story, a Christian. And also, I uh, must inform you uh, that, because this is going to be critical, uh, he also has uh, has his issues. He's still, he's been living with mistress number one, right, with whom he had a child. He's had to um, uh, put her away, send her off with a dowry back to North Africa. uh, And because he has to, he's he's waiting to marry a Christian heiress in a couple of years before that happens, so he decides to take another mistress. Okay, this is his famous, you know, Lord, Give me chastity, but not yet prayer, which I don't wish to advise students, but in any case, that's what he says. All right, so you need to keep that in mind as we get into this passage. He says, I was astonished to find that I already loved you, not a phantom surrogate for you, but I was not stable in the enjoyment of my God. I was caught up to you by your beauty and torn away from you by my weight. With a groan, I crashed into inferior things. This weight was my sexual habit. But with me there remained a memory of you. I was in no kind of doubt to whom I should attach myself, but was not yet in a state to be able to do that. The body, which is corruptible, weighs down the soul, and our earthly habitation drags down the mind to think many things. Moreover, 
I was wholly certain that your invisible nature, since the foundation of the world, is understood from the things which are made, that is, your eternal power and divinity. Uh, and that's sort of the prelude. Now we enter the uh, ascension narrative itself. I asked myself why I approved the beauty of bodies, whether celestial or terrestrial. In what justification I had for giving an unqualified judgment on mutable things, saying, this ought to be thus or that ought not to be thus. In the course of this inquiry, why I made such value judgments as I was making, I found the unchangeable and authentic eternity of truth to transcend my mutable mind. And so, step by step, I ascended from bodies to the soul, which perceive through the body, and from there to its inward force, to which bodily senses report external sensations, this being as high as the beasts go. And from there, I ascended to the power of reasoning, to which is to be attributed the power of judging the deliverances of the bodily senses. This power, which I found in myself to be mutable, raised itself to the level of its own intelligence and led my thinking out of the ruts of habit withdrew itself from the contradictory swarms of imaginative fantasies so as to discover the light by which it was flooded. At that point, it had no hesitation in declaring that the unchangeable is preferable to the changeable, and that on this ground it can know the unchangeable sense, unless it should somehow know this, there would be no certainty in preferring it to the mutable. And so, in the flash of a trembling glance, it attained to that which is. At that moment, I saw your invisible nature understood through the things that are made. But I did not possess the strength to keep my vision fixed. My weakness reasserted itself, and I returned to my customary condition. I carried with me only a loving memory and a desire for that of which I had the aroma but which I had not yet the capacity to eat. Okay, so this is, a, and this is an ascension uh, narrative that he's offered us. Notice that he understands this contemplative ascent to be a cognitive success in which the soul's ethical condition has now been exposed. We need to be quite clear on this. The soul fails to maintain its transcendent state because of its moral condition. Once again, the text does not record a failure, right, at least with respect to his cognition. It articulates the soul's inability to achieve sustained association with the divine. Until he embraced Christ as a mediator, his moral condition would not be strong enough to enjoy God. Augustine emphasizes that this moral transformation can only occur when the soul abandons its confidence in its own spiritual abilities and accepts its weakness and its need for divine assistance. The axis of this text is moral and not experiential. Thus, as Augustine presented a skillfully constructed account of contemplation as an alternative to that of the Platonists, it makes clear that transcendence is possible for the human soul and that certainty can be achieved. But what is denied is that the soul can, by its own power, come to participate continually in the divine. In Platinian terms, the Augustinian soul is fully descended into the world. There is no higher self, no spiritual hook, if you will, that can be used to restore the soul to that world of transcendence and being. Indeed, the brevity of his successful ascent has disappointed Augustine. But Augustine uses that brevity to suggest that the Platonic estimation of the human soul is overblown. Notice that Augustine can make this claim only because he has, in fact, succeeded in the ascent that Platonism offered. But that success only exhibited in its brevity that Platonists were mistaken about the capacity of the soul to sustain that spiritual state. It is not that he failed as a Platonist. Rather, it's that Platonism has failed him. The title theme of the book, by the way, follows immediately after it, and that's not on your handout, but I'll read it to you very briefly. He says, I would learn to discern the, and, and distinguish the difference between presumption, that's the Platonists, and confession, between those who see what the goal is 
but not how to get there. Those are the pagan Platonists. And those who see the way which leads to the home of bliss, not as merely an end to be perceived, but as a realm to live in. Those are the Christians. Confession, then, is an acknowledgment of the limits of contemplation. In some respects, Augustine's whole narrative in the Confessions is preparation for this admission. On all of this, the Platonists are culpably misguided. Dazzled by their vision of transcendence, they have mistaken perception for salvation. Yet the soul cannot save itself as the Platonists would have it. It must be healed in order to hold on to that which contemplation revealed. For the philosopher is not his own savior. So let's turn now to the uh, final section here, the vision at Ostia, which is the most famous of the contemplative texts from ancient Christianity. This text is often depicted as a successful act of contemplation that follows Augustine's baptism and supersedes the failures of Platonic contemplation in Book 7. But as I've just suggested, this imposes, I think, a foreign pattern on the text. As I've indicated, the ascents of Book 7 are successful to the extent that any act of contemplation can be for Augustine. That is, they offer epistemic surety and insight. But they have failed to assure the sanctification of the soul, which awakens again in time, weighed down by its moral state. This is what will happen again at Ostia, even after baptism. Far from being a post-baptismal triumph, the Ostian narrative underscores even more powerfully the limits of contemplation. Let's have a look now at the first section of this great text. Although they don't know this at the time, Monica is about to die, and his mother, and she and Augustine are looking into a garden discussing the life of the saints in heaven. Augustine's been baptized. He's resolved to give up his career, his impending marriage, mistress number two, his wealth, the works, and he's going to go back and live as a kind of proto-monk, right, on one of the family farms, right, in North Africa. Right? That's the plan, and they're waiting to get a ship out. I'm going to start at paragraph number two. Along with each other, we talk very intimately. Forgetting the past and reaching forward to what lies ahead. And we were searching together in the presence of truth, which is you yourself. We asked what quality of life the eternal life of the saints will have. A life that neither eye has seen nor ear heard nor has it entered into the heart of man. But with the mouth of the heart wide open, we drank in the waters flowing from your spring on high, the spring of life, which is with you. Sprinkled with this dew to the limit of our capacity, our minds attempted in some degree to reflect on so great a reality. That's sort of the prologue. Now we enter the ascension narrative. The conversation led us towards the conclusion, the pleasure of the bodily senses, however delightful in the radiant light of this physical world, is seen by comparison with the life of eternity to be not worth considering. Our minds were lifted up by an ardent affection towards eternal being itself. Step by step we climbed beyond all corporeal objects in the heaven itself, where sun, moon, and stars shed light on the earth. We ascended even further by internal reflection and dialogue and wonder at your works, we ended into our own minds. We moved up beyond them so as to attain to the region of inexhaustible abundance where you feed Israel eternally with truth for food. Their life is the wisdom by which all creatures come into being, both things which were and which will be. But wisdom itself is not brought into being, but is as it was and always will be. Furthermore, in this wisdom, there is no past and future, but only being, since it is eternal. For to exist in the past or in the future is no property of the eternal. And while we talked and panted after it, we touched it, in some small degree, by a moment of total concentration of the heart. And he sighed. 
and left behind us the first fruits of the Spirit, bound to that higher world as we return to the noise of our human speech, where a sentence has both a beginning and an ending. But what is to be compared with your word, Lord of our lives? It dwells in you without growing old and gives renewal to all things. So I'm going to stop there, sort of the first narration of this event. There are two aspects of this passage which are, I think, especially interesting. First, you will notice it is a joint ascent involving two people, which is very, very unusual in contemplative literature, and I'll talk about this uh, a little bit more in, in a moment. Second, the contemplative souls sigh and leave behind the first fruits of the Spirit, the Prometheus Spiritus, bound to that higher world. This image, it's an odd and interesting image, is like leaving a, a sort of spiritual place mark there, right, in the heavenly world. Some of you would regard it as a kind of internet cookie, you know, it's left there, right? And it's occasions quite a lot of puzzlement, but I think the theological message of it is clear now that we've thought about the Platonists, right? Because in Plotinus, the ascending soul discovers the undescended self in the eternal world of being as it moves from time into eternity. Yet Augustine countenances no such direct access to an unfallen self. His helplessness, his habituation to sins, his tears of self-betrayal have taught him otherwise. And so, too, his divine grace, his power, affects the conversion of his wholly fallen soul. Thus, the contemplative soul cannot discover its real self within eternal wisdom. There is no higher self to be recovered. Contemplation, thus, can only be an exercise in Christian hope. The discernment of where the self might be if it should achieve salvation. Thus, for Augustine, contemplation is inherently eschatological, and unlike Plotinus, that eschatological hope is not realized by the embodied soul. It can only be actualized after death when the soul is resurrected. The use of first fruits of the Spirit from Romans underscores this eschatological nature of contemplation. Moniker and Augustine thus achieve, through contemplation, an initial hold on wisdom and discover their place of hope, their true place within the divine wisdom. But this option cannot be exercised until the soul has followed Christ into both death and resurrection. Now Augustine then goes on to reflect a second time on is this, this ascension in the next paragraph. And I'm going to read this now. And if you, if you wonder uh, how Augustine managed to come from the outer rim of the Mediterranean world, right, 200 miles inland, right, in uh, the hills of Algeria, all the way to the center of the imperial court on his rhetorical abilities, you need only listen to this amazing passage, which is just brilliantly constructed. Therefore, we said, if to anyone the tumult of the flesh has fallen silent, if the images of earth, water, and air are quiescent, if the heavens themselves are shut out and the very soul itself is making no sound and is surpassing itself by no longer thinking about itself, if all dreams and visions in the imagination are excluded, if all language and every sign and everything transitory is silent, for if anyone could hear them, this is what all of them would be saying. We did not make ourselves. We were made by him who abides for eternity. If, after this declaration, they were to keep silent, having directed our ears to him that made it, then he alone would speak, not through them, but through himself. We would hear his words, not through the tongue of the flesh, nor through the voice of an angel, nor through the sound of thunder, nor through the obscurity of a symbolic utterance. Him who, in these things we love, we would hear in person, 
without mediation. And that is how it was when, at that moment, we extended our reach and, in a flash of mental energy, energy attained the eternal wisdom which abides beyond all things. If only it could last, and other visions of a vastly inferior kind could be withdrawn. Then this alone could ravish and absorb and enfold in inward joys the person granted the vision. So, too, eternal life is of the quality of that moment of understanding after which we sighed. Is not this the meaning of enter into the joy of your Lord? And when is that to be? Surely it is when we all rise again, but are not all changed. Thus, in this passage, Augustine portrays the significance of contemplation as strikingly different from that that can be found in the Libri Platonicorum. The soul's ascension itself underscores its tragic fall, while it is powerless to affect its own return. The Christian soul grasps in contemplation the nobility of its creation, but this involves recognition of the enormity of its spiritual estrangement. Contemplation, then, for Augustine, tra is transformed into a kind of double-edged recognition of the soul's painful fall. Contemplation has secured transcendent knowledge at the expense of the soul's equanimity. I move now to a conclusion, the living soul of the faithful. As noted early, earlier on, one shortcoming of contemporary analysis of contemplative texts is an emphasis on the individual at the expense of social or corporate aspects. This privatization of contemplation, if you will, is dependent on the modern notion of religion itself, which privileges personal experience. As an autobiography, the Confessions is particularly susceptible to this approach. Indeed, Augustine is, in initiating the genre of spiritual testimony, is partly responsible for this tendency in Western religious thought, which would later become secularized. Yet Augustine's theology of contemplation has several aspects that are deeply resistant to this atomistic model, and these warrant brief attention by way of a conclusion. Now, throughout all the depictions of contemplation we've examined, Augustine emphasizes that the self is not alone as an actor or agent. This is clear enough with the participation of Monica at Ostia. On all of these occasions, you notice, it's divine assistance, right, that is critical for the ascension narrative. Moreover, you will notice that these texts are saturated with uh, biblical texts, which are designed for the Christian reader to come to understand the corporate dimension of the church and its voice in the explanation of what it is that's occurring. It is the church that emerges in confessions as the vehicle for Christian contemplation. Augustine views the church not just as a collection of souls called by God to salvation. Rather, it is, he, as he calls it in Book 13, the living soul of the faithful. It is the divine word taught in the Gospels of the church that brings this living soul into existence. This line of reflection draws together contemplation in all of its aspects. Contemplation of the created world, of the Holy Scriptures, of the Divine Word, and finally of the Trinity, and nests all of them in the church. In doing so, Augustine has rejoined contemplation to the path of salvation. Augustine has thereby sketched his theology of contemplation on a vast canvas one that provides a Christian alternative to pagan Platonism. So to conclude, on this reading of the contemplative texts of the Confessions, we can come to appreciate the significance of Augustine's theological achievement. By removing the modern psychological model of mystical experience, it is possible to see the formation of the Latin Christian conception of contemplation in the text that we have before us. It was this Christian conception of contemplation that became normative in Western religious thought. Thus did the West come to distinguish contemplation from salvation and to reject the concept of salvific enlightenment 
found in pagan Platonism. One could well imagine a different outcome, either within Christianity or within Western religious thought as a whole. For this decisive historical shift, we have Augustine, in some measure, to praise or to blame. Thanks very much for your attention. Uh, we have time for questions. <clears throat> I've been asked to um, have you speak into this mic if you have a question. So, <clears throat> weakened as I am by my uh, length of austerity, uh, I will nonetheless be happy to stand here and take as many questions uh, as you've got. Do you want to start off with students before we turn to faculty? Do we want to see if there are any student questions? I uh, sometimes find that that can be helpful. Students, what do you think for extra credit? <laughs> extra, extra credit. Extra, extra credit, yes. Right, I, extra, I'll give you St. Mike's credit on top of How's that for Blue Jays, huh? What do you think? Any questions? Can give it a whirl? You not have any mystical moments here that you want to... Yes, if not, we can, we can move on to the back row there, but... All right, uh, Sean, go ahead. Go for it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks for explaining the difference between and also the similarity with the um, monotheistic Platonism. Yes. Uh, now, I think some terms are stumbling blocks, like contemplation as knowledge, because in our usage, knowledge is distancing, it's about. And this right. seems to be the, the very different kind of knowledge of being touched by and present to. Yes. Um, so I, I guess my question is, if once, we under, once we're actually touched by the direct presence of God, we have no doubt about God's reality. Right. The hope is about our own worthiness or our own journey. Um, so what does that mean for faith, again, in terms of what we have come to mean about faith as um, trust that there is a God? This doesn't involve trust. This is proof. Yes, right, absolutely. So to begin at the beginning of, uh, of your uh, uh, comment, uh, I, I think it's uh, absolutely correct to say that we're moving beyond any kind of dualistic or mediated knowledge about God. Right, into some kind of direct and immediate knowledge of God in which the self has somehow been so fundamentally changed that you have that moment of association. Right? So I think that's, that's absolutely correct. And I think that's what has uh, driven interest right, in this pinnacle type of knowledge, which the Platonists themselves understand to go beyond the level of noetic thinking, the level of noose in which you're knowing about something, even if you're knowing about forms or other things that are you know, necessarily known. It's, it's moving beyond that. Now, if you think about it, um, the, the, the articulation here of the nature of the soul that um, has been suggested uh, indicates that Augustine realizes that that knowledge is not total and complete and so transformative that we don't end up back down, right? in our daily quotidian life, right? So we're back in the, in, in, in the daily grind. He says, we retain that knowledge of the certainty of divine existence, but in many respects, we have to continue to function as we always have. So faith, while it has secured that higher knowledge, still remains part of what we have to use to continue our daily life, and especially we have to find ourselves accessing the divine grace to keep us going. One of the things that's fascinating, uh, in most recent book that I did, um, I did a kind of prequel to the book I did on the confessions, as they say in Hollywood, right? And I went back to the earliest writings of Augustine. You know, the stuff that he wrote even before he was baptized, right? We have a whole collection of works from before his baptism when he's, when he's thinking about it, and then the early works afterwards. And what's really fascinating is that he has a whole series of different articulations of these ascents, and in several of them, when you end up back down, it's like you start over again. So it isn't as if it's a one shot, you did it, you got it, you're completely transformed, because, and this is the big point for Augustine, we're all still human. So even with that type of certainty emerging from the immediacy of the knowledge of the divine presence and the absolute certainty comes with it, because we're human beings and our human condition 
We still have to come back through the struggle, right, to achieve salvation. So it's that separation then of knowledge and salvation that is the poignancy, right, of the Augustinian understanding of what the Christian life is. Else. I think I want to ask you about the transcendence issue. Right. Which, you know, we've talked about this before, but I just find that to be so interesting that you could get to the fourth century um, and still have, like you said, someone with Augustine's education for whom this is a radical idea. Right. And that's. I think really understated. I mean, or underappreciated about what a revolution that is. Right, and I think that, um, as you know, the more uh, some of us have studied these things, the more we've come to realize um, that, s- that, that that these ideas were not really clearly understood by so many of the early church thinkers, uh, and we can speculate on a certain strand of individuals that seem to be. Getting it, but I think it's just absolutely remarkable that that this brilliant rhetorician with a terrific education would be shocked in his thirties, right, to think that the way to think about God is as an immaterial being at another level of reality. But right? that's that's and, and I, it's it's clear that it's not just a matter of Manichaeism. And by the way, uh, in the in the books of the Confessions that, that uh, uh, most people never get around to. Uh, and I'm culpable in this because I don't always assign them either, right, to students, right, the late books. Uh, he has a long struggle, in, particularly in 11 and 12, arguing with Christians who do not accept this concept of transcendence and, moreover, will not accept the type of exegesis that goes with it, which is allegorical exegesis. Those things are linked. Right? And so when he is reading so much of the biblical material, uh, he he gets that concept, that sort of transcendent loft, right, by seeing symbolically uh, those notions in the text, right, and he sees that deeper allegory as being the necessary way to read, especially the Old Testament. So, if you've read the Confessions, he says, um, you know, I thought I thought the Old Testament was you know just ridiculous, and uh, as a manichae, I thought it was beneath me. To think like that, and once I learned this concept of transcendence from Ambrose, and with it, a method of interpretation that allowed me to see a deeper understanding of the spiritual meanings, right, and the larger symbolic significance, then I was able to see something I hadn't seen before. Very, very remarkable way of thinking. Would be see that somebody down the back has the has the has the mic there. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank, thank you very much for uh, the clarity of your presentation. I'm, I'm not a patristic scholar, but uh, but it seems to me when when um, when Saint Basil's dealing with uh, Genesis 127, uh, human beings created in the image of God. Uh, well, Irenaeus first, and then Saint Basil. Uh, it, it, for them, it includes the body, yes. the human body. Uh, of course, for, uh, for Origen, it did not. For Gregory of Nyssa, it did not. Uh, is is this is this why I mean this this discussion about well, transcendence? This is something that uh, Professor O'Keefe and I were talking about earlier today. Uh, I, I think it's I think a principle to sit around in scholarship right now um, is to go back and work through the major figures and try to see exactly what they're thinking about this concept of transcendence. It's clear that Gregory of Nyssa is he's there. On this, um, and I don't know Basil of Caesarea well enough to be able to pronounce on on that. Um, and so, what one needs to do is really go back and study very, very carefully the development of this of this notion. I think it's it's utterly critical. When you get to Plotinus, right in the pagan tradition, that's where everything falls into place, right? Because he's the you know he really makes the big move with the concept of divine infinity absolute transcendence of the one uh, from everything else. Uh, and then that influences various Christian figures, Marius Victorinus, certainly, 
you know, so it, it goes into the, into the uh, intellectual bloodstream of the ancient world. Tracking that is itself um, quite difficult. Um, right. And they may be very different, by the way, you know, because Irenaeus uh, is, I think, playing with a different philosophical deck than, uh, yeah. Right, that's right. Yeah, I don't think irony is uh, Baza no no. So um, this is a very it's a it's it's I think it's an absolutely fascinating thing. And and by the way, if you if if you think about it, if we're trying to understand this enormous cultural shift that occurs of monotheism, right? This is the period when it occurs. Transcendence seems to have been a vital component in that in that movement, right? Because otherwise, you're just contrasting you know one cosmic god as opposed to a whole bunch of them, right? And really, this is a, this is a major move. Um, and it motivates uh, a whole new spiritual vector. I'll just add this. Think about it. If, if in older religious thinking, you're really talking about a, this a kind of cosmic way of reflecting on God and you're doing sacrifices that are going up, you know, to God, uh, you know, you're looking up. But notice the vector in these passages, the move now is interior, which is then central for the motivation of monasticism, you know, so many things that emerge out of this shift. So I think it's not just monotheism, but as it were, transcendental monotheism, which is, which is crucial. Um, hold on a second, I think this, yes. Yeah, and does the sense of transcendence also include an omnipresence? Yes. Yes, and one of the one of the really powerful things that we find in Plotinus's version of it is that he announces that in the strongest possible way, that as it were, because God is nowhere, God is now everywhere. Because God's presence is no longer spatial, God is ontologically present. And if you think about it, all of these critical ideas that I've articulated that are the fundamental moves in late antiquity, then are absorbed into Jewish, Christian, and, Islam, and, and Islamic scholasticism. Right? So they lock all of these ideas in. This is the period, however, when you know, they're originally initiated. Ideas like omnipresence and, and so forth. Um, John, thank you very much. A question. Uh, <coughs> do you... Can, can you specify any impact on Augustine's <coughs> future theology after his breakthrough into transcendence? Um, and I'm me. thinking specifically about uh, uh, the accusations ooh, aimed at him uh, in terms of sexual morality. Um, well, could you specify that a little bit? Further, what you have in mind. Well, I'm, I'm just wondering uh, <laughs> about the, the breakthrough into transcendence, and then you have to come back. You, yes. you come back down from the contemplative position down to the bodily position. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, right. uh, what do you bring back with you? No, what did he bring back with him? Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question. You know, uh, one of the things, as you know, that Augustine does very early on after he was compelled, as some of you know, to become a priest, that was not his intention. He was physically forced to become a priest. It's an interesting way to develop vocations. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, well, I, at St. Michael's, we have the Order of, of St. Edmund, and there are 30 remaining members, so I try to bring this up as often as possible. So, so he was physically forced to be a priest and physically forced then to become a bishop. First thing he does, of course, is write the confessions because he has to write his own uh, story before somebody else writes it for him, right? Because he's in a he's had a, he's had a past, right? But he also sets out to write works on the good of marriage and the good of monasticism, right? So it seems as if those are the two established lives, with monasticism being the more fundamental of the two, right? And you know that was common enough given the precedent of Christ, you know, in the period. But nonetheless, that's what he does. Now, the concept of transcendence, I think, allows him to revalorize in a very positive way the nature of the body. 
because unlike many of the earlier theories where the body was clearly lower as a dark material thing, in Augustine's thinking, the real source of evil is never the body. What is it? It's the inner self, the soul. So you can't, in Augustine's thinking, pawn evil off into your body. That was the Manichaean move, right? It's the body that makes me do it. My soul's along for the ride, right? But for, for him, the key to takeaway from transcendence is that the inner soul is related to a god, and we are separate from that god. We have fallen from that god because of the choices that we individually have made. So our bodies, right? The body is just a token of where we are, and he recognized that the body was created by God. The real problem of evil is the inner struggle that we have to engage in. And in the confessions, as he says, uh, it's a struggle of two contending wills. You know, Augustine uh, invented so many things. And there's a wonderful book by Albrecht Diehl, the great classicist, his Sather lectures um, in the early 80s, called Augustine's Invention of the Will. Right? Another one of the many things that Augustine is responsible, in a sense, um, for inventing. So it's the will that is, in a sense, uh, made increasingly clear as a result of his renewed understanding or his revised understanding of God. So another question out back there? Yeah. <clears throat> no. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, and I appreciate your your reference to Father Teske, who was my Augustine teacher at Marquette. Oh, so lucky you. you. Yeah. Had some fond memories of terrific. his class. Yeah, wonderful. Yes, yeah. Wonderful terrific person. scholar. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, so I had a question. I mean, I'm interested in sort of the how Augustine thinks about the role of philosophy in the spiritual life or in the Christian right. life. I mean, I think early on and you know, he saw Christianity as a school of philosophy yes. sort of in competition with the other schools of philosophy around his time. And so uh, I'm thinking in particular of Pierre Doe's work on philosophy as a way of life. And he, right. you know, sort of critical of, you know, especially into the medieval period, you sort of lose this idea of philosophy as a way of life. Really, theology takes over or sort of gets bifurcated in this sort of yeah. way. And, um, and it's sort of, you're sort of referencing his sort of, um, you know, his sort of pushback against the Platonists, um, you know, the, the philosopher can save himself. I'm just sort of wondering if you could give a little more picture of Augustine's sort of thought about the place of philosophy. Certainly he wants yeah. to say, you know, Monica can, you know, have the same vision of God that the philosopher can, but <clears throat> does philosophy play some authentic and important role, not discardable role? Yes, right. One, yeah, wonderful question. So let me, uh, let me say, I think that, uh, again, with so many of these terms, um, w w once again, we're freighted with terms like philosophy and theology uh, that, that really come into their own uh, in, in the early scholastic period, right, 11th, 12th century. I think when we go back to the early period, we have to be careful, again, in the, in the use of it. The, actually, the Christians, as was pointed out in a recent book by uh, Jean-Yves Lacoste, uh, it's called From theology to theological thinking. He points out, you know, early Christians use philosophy even as a term even more than theology because theology was often in pagan discourse used uh, sort of the way we would use mythology in relationship to articulation of the stories of the gods and things like that. So the, the, the terminology is fairly fluid in this period. Okay, so we'll just to get the, that behind us. So the other thing is, he really thinks that whatever he's doing, call it philosophy, theology, it is a way of life, the Ado thing. Uh, it's a way of life, and in a sense, the Christian way of life is a more effective philosophy in the broad sense of philosophy uh, than the uh, alternatives that are out there. Certainly more so than academic skepticism, which he tells us he tries out for a while, um, certainly more than Stoicism, which he doesn't seem to be attracted by at all, certainly more so than Platonism. Um, now, exactly, this is where it gets a little tricky, exactly what he knew about Platonism and at what time and which school in antiquity is a little more complicated. And I don't want to, so in other words, philosophy itself is a complex notion. And the point I'm trying to make is that, um, as you know, there's a whole wing of ancient 
Neoplatonism after Plotinus um, that essentially moves so closely to the pagan religion that it develops uh, its own sacramental, you know, magical, theurgical traditions. Um, and so by that point, philosophy has moved into being so capacious that it includes uh, ritual, right? So, uh, so to actually pin that question down, you know, you have to think of how broad philosophy really was. Our notion of philosophy, but it's a much, much narrower and, and more of a, you know, intellectual notion. That's why your point about Ado is so important. We've got to understand that when they're doing philosophy, it's really committing yourself to a whole way of life. And as you know, you, you, you put on new garments, you know, in a sense of, a habit, you know, and you went out there and advertised yourself as a philosopher. So the boundaries are very, very different. I see a handout back there. Thank you. So, um, I wonder if there's something, I think you were kind of emphasizing the idea of the modern contemplative or mystical tradition. There's a kind of a modern idea and also associating it with, let's just say, individualism. Right. I wonder if it, I was thinking though too, in, in connection with the first, the first question about uh, whether or not uh, it's a way of, it, it, it be, it's also a consequence of giving up on rational uh, proofs of the existence of God or ra uh, rational indicators, whether or right. not that's, that's involved in it too. Because, uh, so it strikes me, I mean, in, in reading the confession, one of the things that strikes me about it is that how many different ways uh, Augustine sees God as present. And I don't know whether to say directly or immediately. I'm just kind of wondering whether directly and immediately are even the same thing. Sure. Whereas when he says everything, and you quoted that, in fact, everything shouts out the existence of God because he's so convinced of Every finite thing is dependent upon God, and so once you get that idea, whether it's a philosophical or a theological idea, then God's sort of shouting from you every from every yes. every corner of the world. I mean, his his, his idea about the God's laws written in our hearts, our conscience—that's the, the the guilt we feel. These are all like like there's so many uh, ways in which God is present to us, and I, I it's like I guess I'm. Wondering two things about that. One, whether or not uh, moving into a world where people don't think that way, and then if you want to have God present to you, you have to think in terms of some individualized mystical experience. Right. Uh, right. And the other thing is also that, I mean, going back to the first question, whether or not God isn't very uh, present to us in a very convincing way. Without that, uh, without the kind of ascent, mm -hmm. uh, right, uh, moments that you that sure talk about. yes. Well, there's an awful lot in that uh, uh, question, and I think that to uh, really get at it, one, what one would need to do is think about what happens first in the scholastic period regarding the nature of knowledge, uh, and then as we move into the the, the nominalist period. Uh, you know, developing of uh, increased privileging of, of experience, and then er, into early modern thinking. Think of Pascal that came to mind when, when you were speaking, the god of the philosophers on the one hand, right, and the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm thinking of the famous memorial of Pascal's mystical experience, um, in which you begin to have mysticism emerging in that early modern period, as a type of immediacy, very different from the kind of um, logical conversation that you would have in the context of scholastic philosophy, just to take a very broad um, separation, or in Pascal's case, uh, what's going on in, uh, in the increasing developments of rationalism. Right? So I think that's fair enough. The problem is, as we come down range with that concept, by the time we get to William James, and we move into the 20th century, we're now talking about not knowledge, as you know from James, but a feeling of knowledge. Because mystical experience is so radically personal and private that the public aspect that we regard as critical to knowledge is not available. Right? It has certainty only for the individual. For Augustine, it's clear 
that these are a sense that are getting at a very deep concept of truth. Right? Absolutely public truth, even if the moment of access is private. Right? And that he is having a really deep noetic experience that is true. And that's what he thinks, right? So this is a very, I mean, it's very much a, a Platonist understanding, remembering that Platonism isn't really a form of rationalism because the whole self has to be transformed in order to be achieving the kind of higher levels of, of knowledge that he thinks human beings are, uh, have access to. Right? So I think this, I think the force of what Augustine is saying combines a sense of deep cognition and arranges it such that the private self is here described as achieving it. But the privacy of that sort of spiritual adventure doesn't undercut the nature of the knowledge that uh, occurs. I think we have to cut it off now, but uh, please join me in thanking John for his uh... Thank you very much. Thanks.